Hi, thanks for tuning in to Firmly Rooted. Here's the message from Pastor Tom Donovan. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, bless the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts. May they be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. The text for today's message is a continuation of the series of phrases of Jesus on the cross. And today we look at a phrase that says, I thirst. I thirst. Hey, girls, what do you do when you're thirsty? Get a drink from your mom and dad. You get a drink from your mom and dad. And where do they go get that drink? by the sink because they turn on the faucet and the water comes out guess what do you know that sometimes I go to Haiti I go to Haiti sometimes you know where Haiti is Haiti's like way down past Florida and it's really hot there you went there before Wow well then you know that they don't have a faucet to go get water do you know that no, nope, they don't have a fridge to get water. So what do they do when they're thirsty? Do you know? They don't have one. It's hard, isn't it? Do you know what they do? They have to walk miles and miles and miles to a well, and they have to work to push the water up from the ground into a bucket, and they have to carry it all the way home. That's a lot of work to get water, isn't it? All we have to do is go to the sink and toss it on and we get some water. But we can get it from the fridge too. You can get it from the fridge too. <sighs> there has, in life, a lot of things that affect your perspective. Nothing more in mine than going to Haiti and watching women carrying water miles so that their families can cook, so that their families can have water, so that they can quench a thirst. I mean, we take it so far because we can go up to that faucet or that refrigerator and push the little button. We can get ice cubes on one side and water on the other, and we can quench our thirst instantaneously. For you young people, I want you to know that this is not true in 90% of the world. In 90% of the world, they just can't walk up into their kitchen and go get some water. They got to work to go get it. They got to work to go get it. In Africa, there are women that have two and a half hours to get water only to bring it back home and then to have to do it again in the evening to get water. A basic necessity to live. And so as you think about that, I can remember there were only a few times in my life when I felt like I was going to pass out or dehydrate. One of them was when we were in football and doing our doubles in the middle of the summer and my coach didn't have enough common sense to let us go home on a day that was almost 100. The other was in Haiti. After the earthquake, I spent almost two and a half, three months in Haiti and my body was putting out more water in sweat than I could drink. And there was a time that about 10 30, 11 o'clock, I told Kimberly, I'm, I'm toast. Something's wrong. Isn't it interesting that we have this thing called thirst? And, and, and what I want you to realize is that Jesus on the cross is saying, I thirst. But theologically, I have an inherent problem with this. Isn't this the same Jesus that said to the woman at the well, if you knew who it was who was asking for a drink, you would ask him and he would give you living water. So here you have the source of eternal water saying, I'm thirsty. I mean, isn't this the same Jesus? Isn't this the same God that caused water to come out of a rock so the children of Israel could drink? What's going on that our Savior and our Lord is saying the word, I thirst, when He's the source of everything? 
that satisfies our thirst. Do you see what I'm saying? We've got to freeze in this moment. We've got to freeze in this moment and say, Jesus, why are you saying I thirst? You're the source of the answer to thirst. You're the one that brings the, the coolness. You're the one that refreshes my soul. You're the one that well. But you see, just recently Jesus spoke those words, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? See, just recently in the darkness, he bore all of humanity's sins. He bore yours and mine, and he bore its punishment upon himself. And, and now Jesus, his physical body, he's had enough. He can't take anymore. I want to talk to you about your thirst. Isn't it interesting that we are always accusing God that he just doesn't understand what we're going through? When in fact, he's experienced things that we'll never understand. When he became man and suffered, when he became man, he experienced things that we will never understand. He absolutely knows what we go through. He absolutely knows what we wrestle with. He absolutely knows the thirst of our hearts. So I want to take us through, for those of you who take notes, three scenarios. I'm going to take you through three scenarios and three points within each scenario. Scenario number one, we reference the woman at the well. Many of you know the story, but some of you may not. So there was this day when Jesus went through Samaria instead of going around Samaria. See, Jews always went around Samaria because they hated Samaritans. But Jesus went through Samaria, stops at an ancient well, Jacob's well, and he sends his disciples in to go get some food, and he sits and he waits. We've talked about this a few weeks ago, but I want you to be there. I want you to see that this woman, just like in Haiti, she comes out in the middle of the day with a bucket and she wants to get her fill of water so that she can take that water back home. She doesn't come during the morning when everyone else comes, when all the other ladies are coming. She comes in the middle of the day, in the heat of the day, and we'll soon, we'll soon know why. But Jesus, sitting at the well, says to her, would you give me a drink? And she immediately says, why are you even talking to me? You're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan and we hate each other. So let's just get to the point. I'm not giving you a drink. Jesus says, if you knew who it was that was asking you for a drink, you would ask him and he would give you living water that would well up in you like a fountain. You don't even have a bucket. How can you offer me anything to drink when you're the one that asked me for a drink because I'm the one with the bucket? I don't know who you are, but you don't have a bucket, so you can't get me a drink. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. The water that I can give you will well up in you like eternal life. It'll well up you like in a fountain. She goes, oh man, give me this drink so that I don't ever have to come back here. She's now beginning to realize that maybe this guy's a prophet. Maybe there's something going on here. So she says, give me this water so that I never have to come back here and drink. What's he talking about? Or is she talking about? Physical thirst. Scenario 1.1. We have a bodily need. We have a natural need. We need nourishment. We need food. We need water. And she's coming out for it. And she's talking to the source of all nourishment. She doesn't know it yet. And Jesus is saying that there is a more thirst. So the three things that we're going to hit in this story is physical thirst, emotional thirst, and spiritual thirst. So she says finally, okay, because I never want to come back here again. And Jesus says, okay, all right, I'll give it to you, but first, first, I want you to go home and get your husband and bring him here. Now we're going to talk about emotional thirst. 
go home, get your husband, we'll take care of this. I, I don't have a husband. You are right in saying, in fact, you've had four husbands and the one you're with right now is not your husband. Who? Who? How do you know that? How do you know me? And by the way, how do you know that I have an emotional need? How do you know that I'm struggling? That I have a thirst on the inside? That relationally things aren't hitting, things aren't working? I just don't have a physical need, but I got an emotional need. I obviously have not fulfill my emotional need. I've gone through four husbands and the one I'm with right now is not my husband. I'm a mess. I not only, I not only physically have a thirst, but I emotionally have a thirst. And so she says, I, I, I can only assume that you're a prophet. But hey, prophet, you Jews, you Jews say that we should worship on in Jerusalem. But our religious leaders say that we should worship here on this mountain so what's right about that where should we worship there's so much confusion there's so much untruth i don't know and now he's getting to spiritual thirst right look at what he's transitioning in this in this scenario he's talking about physical thirst emotional sp thirst and now spiritual thirst where's worship supposed to be mister because all we do is live in conflict you Jews hate us, we hate you, and, and it's all about theology, it's all about religion, it's all about yuck. And Jesus says, neither, 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 neither is right, because you understand that someday we're going to worship in spirit and truth. It's not about religious ceremony, it's about doing it the right way, it's about the heart She wisely says to him, the one thing I know, the one thing I know, sir, is that someday there's going to be a Messiah and he's going to come and he will bring truth to these things. Bring truth to what? He will bring truth to physical thirst. He will bring truth to emotional and relational thirst. He will bring truth to spiritual thirst. He is the one. He is the one, and we're waiting for Him to come, and He says, I am He. And she drops her bucket, and she runs into town. All three thirsts filled in one moment. All of a sudden, her physical thirst didn't have a high priority. The things of this world didn't have a huge... All of a sudden, all the priorities shifted and they found themselves in the right place. All of a sudden, her heart was redeemed and saved from all of those broken relationships because now she has the one relationship which is necessary, the one with her Savior, the one with the Messiah, the one that brought truth. And with that, she runs into town to proclaim to her whole town that despised her because she was a wayward woman, and that's why she went out to get water in the afternoon. She went into town loving them and wanting them to meet the Savior so that they might find the right place for their physical thirst, find the right place for their emotional thirst, and find the right place for their spiritual thirst. Jesus, scenario number two, is dying on a cross. He physically thirsts. If you've ever done a study of what Jesus went through, from the arrest on Good Friday to the crucifixion, you know that it has been physically grueling. The physical punishment, the deprivation of food and water, the fact that he has been treated the way he has been, he physically thirsts. I don't know how you theologically wrap your minds around it, but the one who created water wanted some. His human nature had had enough. Emotionally. 
emotionally. Everyone was hurling insults at him. Even his own disciples were fleeing from him. He had no one. He was alone. He was alone. Spiritually, he was experienced separation from God. He experienced punishment. He experienced hell in our place. You don't think God understands what you're going through? Stop it. Jesus became man, not so that you might not just know him, but so that he might know you and you might trust that because he was tempted, because he suffered. He knows. There is nothing that you can experience that he does not understand. There is no internal thirst of your soul that he has not felt. And why did he do all that? Because he loves you. Because he loves me. Oh. Scenario number three. What about you and me? Where's your physical thirst today? Are you so focused on the almighty dollar? Are you so, so focused on getting ahead? Are you so focused on what this life can give that you're not realizing that every day you live is a day closer to your death, not a day closer to life? See, we brought nothing into this world and we can take nothing out. We labor in vain if this is what we work for. If we are constantly churning and churning and churning to satisfy the physical thirst of our lives, we're missing the point. We're missing the point. There is nothing here that can satisfy us. There is nothing here that can meet our needs. There is nothing here. Because you will thirst again. You will be hungry again. You will want again. Where has your wandering heart taken you? Where has your life taken you? Where are you probing out there in the darkness like a blind man wanting to know who's going to bring sanity to all of this? My heart yearns. My, my soul thirsts. I feel dry. And nothing that I'm tasting, nothing that I'm doing in this life is satisfying. There might be a few of you today who know exactly what I'm talking about. There may be some of us today who look at our relationships and see the brokenness and we wonder if anything's going to change. We just feel like it's dry as a desert. It doesn't have to just be a marriage relationship. It could be friends. It could be a family member. It could be a brother or a sister. It could be a son or a daughter. But the point is, it's dry. And it seems like nothing you do can repair it. That nothing's bringing any quenching water to the thirst of the relationship. It just is dry and it's dying. And maybe some of you can relate to that as well. And if we relate to that, all of a sudden we can say, doggone it, I'm not sure I like that, those first hymns that we sang. It's not well with my soul. It is not well with my soul. I find myself in the desert yearning for something and there's nothing. I'm clawing and scratching and I'm not getting anywhere. God, sometimes even you seem far from me. Sometimes you seem far from my cries, my tears. When are you going to act? When are you going to do something? When are you going to bring me what I need? Right now. I thirst for you. I thirst for you. I went through what I went through for you. And now I have a thirst for your heart. I have a thirst for your soul. I have a thirst for you. I've come to redeem and to save you. Let's take these three and put them in the right order. The woman didn't understand anything until the spiritual thirst was met first. Amen? You got it? 
So as he hangs from the cross, ask him why. You didn't have to be there. You're the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. You could have listened to them and you could have come off the cross. You could have slayed them all. You could have silenced them. You're God. Why did you let it keep happening? Why did you let it get to the point where you thirst? So that you might know how much I love you. So that you might know how far I would go for you. So that you might know that there is no thirst that you have experienced that I have not experienced and I can redeem and save you from it. So first understand who I am. I am your Lord and I am your Savior and I have breathed life into you. Oh, may the Holy Spirit touch our hearts right now so that we might feel what the woman felt. Why did she leave her bucket? She came there for water. Can you feel it? That moment, she didn't need the bucket because there was something in her that was more powerful than any water could give her. It was overflowing to the point where she had to go tell people. This is what the Holy Spirit has to offer you. This is what the work of salvation has to offer you. That God can satisfy your thirst and your yearnings. Have you ever thought about the fact that in all of the Bible, God never gave someone just enough except during the Exodus? Just enough bread. In every other relationship and every other work that God did, He always gave more. When he fed the 5,000 with a few fish and a few, there were baskets of leftovers. Why didn't God just create enough so that he could eat? Why leftovers? Both times. Why does he say that I'll give you living water that will well up in you like a fountain and overflow? Because God doesn't just want to quench your thirst. He wants to make it so you don't thirst again. And he wants to well up in you so that your overflowing fluids, water, the, the, that eternal flu, flow would touch others around you. Now, take that to your relationships. If the God of the universe is powerful enough to take our hearts of stone and make them hearts of flesh, if he's powerful enough to set his spirit upon us and take dead bones and make them alive, can he not talk to our relationships? See, the problem is I think we do too much talking. We want to be the master of the problem. We want to be the solution. We want to make the... We want to do it. How about if we let go and let God do it? How about if it's more of a surrender to let God do it the way He wants to do it? See, not the world according to Tom. But a Tom who surrenders to the will of God and trusts that God will take care of the broken relationships. And then you work your way up to the least of the thirst, which is actually the reason why she came. Our physical thirst. God is the provider of all good gifts. If He can save our souls, He can provide us our daily bread if he can save our souls he knows your needs whether they're economic whether they're relational whether they're spiritual he gets it he's you're his child trust that he is going to work in and through you one last statement there might be a practical reason why jesus said i thirst it could be that he's only got a few phrases left. And it could be that he so wants everyone to hear the next two phrases that he wants to make sure that he wets the whistle so that he can speak with a loud voice. But that will take your attendance next week. Heavenly Father, stir in our hearts. May the Spirit well up in us. May we feel the replenishing nourishment of your spirit. May we feel the flowing within us. May we, may we feel the life being granted to us. May we feel your breathing deeply into us. May our dead bones come to life. May our hearts of stone be hearts of flesh. And may we trust 
that, Lord, because you thirst, you understand ours. It doesn't matter whether it's, an, whether it's an emotional thirst, whether it's a physical thirst, or whether it is a spiritual thirst. You go before us to quench those thirsts. You go before us as the source by which we can have them relieved and met. Father, be that for us, even this day, so that we might say, it is well with our souls. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for tuning in. For more messages and teachings, visit our website at www.firmlyrooted.org.